very much for that warm welcome. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, it's great to be back in Adelaide. I grew up here, I spent uh, half my life here, and uh, to come back and look out, watch the sun rising over the torrent is something special. I'm not really a morning person. I'm impressed that you all got here at seven o'clock in the morning. The first person I ran into, um, well, she kind of launched herself at me out in the corridor, was Franca Di Bartolo, um, who was um, a pretty, and she had launched herself at me many times before, I might say, but usually with her studs up. So when I saw her coming, I was like, whoa, Franca. Um, we played in the state team together back in uh, the 80s, which sounds like a long time ago, it actually was a long time ago. Um, but anyway, not being a morning person, I thought I should check that you're all fully awake with a couple of questions. Um, first of all, who knows who Alex Chidiak is? Okay. All right, so Alex Chidiak is a South Australian. Alex is a professional footballer. Uh, played for Adelaide United, played for the Young Matildas, the Matildas. Last night, you might have seen her carving up the Argentines in midfield, uh, last night in the match. And she plays for Atletico Madrid in La Liga, Femenino, in Spain. Uh, now, Alex's team had a cup quarter-final a couple of months ago. Does anyone know how many people showed up to watch them play? Any takers? 48,000 people showed up to watch Atletico Madrid beat Atletico Bilbao. And that's just the quarterfinal in Spain, right? So, again, who thinks we could get 48,000 people here to watch your W League team? Okay, got, we've got some takers. Who thinks we could at least fill Hindmarsh? Yeah, that's a bit better. Who thinks we could get at least as many as watch the A-League? Yeah, most of you. Well, that's called the gender crowd gap, right? And I think we could close it. I think we could close it. Because I'm here to tell you that diversity is the future of sport. Diversity, including gender diversity, is the future of sport. And we can and should close that gap. Let me tell you a story. I want to take you back a hundred years. Now, I know everything was in black and white then, but, but I want to try and imagine the colour. Uh, it's 1920. World War I has just ended, and you're full of hope. You're young. During the war, you, you actually went to work. All the men were away at war, and you went to work in factories. You actually worked in a munitions factory called Dick Kerr & Co. You made munitions. <laughs> Uh, for the men to use while they were away. Men's football was suspended for the, for the war, so you actually played in the factory football team, and the women had a league, and it got really popular. You used to raise money uh, for the war effort. And the war ended, and you kept playing, and it was still really popular. People pay in their thousands to come and watch you play. And on this day, you've got a big match. You're playing at Goodison Park. It's a club match. It's one of the biggest matches of the year. It's cold. You're wearing your woolen hat. Nearly everyone in the stadium is wearing a hat. There's 53,000 people inside that stadium and there's thousands more outside who couldn't get in. The economy's booming. There's even talk that women might get the vote. Fancy that. And you're thinking, what a time to be alive. Well, unfortunately, there's a backlash. Because the very next year, in 1921, the old men at the FA sat around in their committee table and they decided to ban women's football. And it stayed banned in England for most of last century. And if it wasn't for that ban, I think we would be living in a different world because from there, England exported football to the world for men. It was the most popular game in the world. It is the most popular game in the world. But if anyone tries to tell you that people aren't interested to watch women play sport, 
I would remind them that that is not the natural order of things. That is a fiction that was sold to us last century because we all grew up in a world where women were deprived from the opportunity of playing and seeing the game. You know, some research that was done in England a few years ago showed that 75% of women said they would like to play more sport, but they didn't for fear of being judged on their appearance or on their ability. Let me say that again. Three out of four women wanted to do something that was healthy and fun, but they did it because they're afraid of what you might think of her. These are the kinds of barriers that we live with uh, as women wanting to participate in sport. Yet we know that sport itself is better when women are involved. Does anyone remember the 90s? I know it's a long time ago for some of you. Uh, in the 90s, football stadiums in Europe were places where you know, people went to fight each other. It was like a skinhead battleground. And they studied this and they thought, what is going to stop people rioting? And the answer was two things. First thing was seats because it turns out that seated fans don't riot. And the second thing was women, because simply their presence in the crowd had a pacifying effect. More women, less riots, right? And that's good for the men too. I've lived sport my whole life. Um, as Kate said, I got to vice captain the Matildas back in the day when we paid our own airfares and we once trained in a car park. And uh, I remember once we were given our, the crests to sew onto our tracksuits, um, which wasn't very successful, I might add. And much later, I also got to be one of those first three women who went and joined the board of FIFA after 108 years of all-male governance. So I got an inside look at this institution and what it had become in those 108 years. I was in the hotel in Zurich when the arrests were made before dawn and the colleagues were taken away in bands. I got to see close up the painful neglect of the women's game around the world and also the profound impact that inclusion can have. It was in Mexico a few years ago that I met a woman who ran a football social development program for girls on a, an indigenous Mexican community. Uh, she was teaching them about sexual and reproductive health and she had a program that involved football. So in this community, for the first time, they saw girls going onto the field in their local community and playing football. Uh, and they had a great day, enjoyed it enormously. The township came out and watched. And at the end of the day, a man came out of the crowd and he, he went to my friend and said, do you, do you, did you run this today? And she said, yeah. He said, well, there's something you need to know. The teacher in our primary school is raping the students. He's showing them pornography and he's raping the students. Can you imagine in primary school? So she called law enforcement and there was an intervention and those girls had a chance at recovery. But my point is this. There was something about watching girls play football that triggered in this man the need to speak up. Perhaps he saw those girls in a way he'd never seen them before. They're out on the field, like the boys, they were playing football, having a great time, deserving of rights. Because here's the thing, when a girl plays football, the world sees her differently. And instead of telling her that she's got pretty hair or a lovely dress, she gets told that she's made a great run, she scored a fantastic goal or made a brilliant save. And she sees that she's valued, not just for how she looks, but for the contribution she can make, for what she does. And that can make a profound difference to her ambition over her whole life. That's why it's important that we close the gender gap. That's why it's worth it to make this kind of change. Because until we do, 
we're really only tapping half the talent pool. You know, we're like a player who only kicks with one foot or a farmer who only sows half the field. If we want to reach our potential as a species, we need to involve everyone in our endeavours. So what can you do to make a difference? Well, I like to think of the present as, as half time. Right? The first half is done, you can't change what's happened. But the score represents the starting point for the second half. And you have the opportunity to change that score line and make things different. So here's a few thoughts on what we can all do. A couple of things to avoid and then some things that we can do positively. I'll start with the don'ts. Don't be that guy from the FA in 1921 who sat in the committee room and said, oh, this is a terrible, terrible thing, totally unsuitable for ladies, dreadful, dreadful, must put a stop to it. Right? Sat there in his smoking jacket in the mahogany corridor somewhere in a club. Don't be that guy, right? There's a thing called a backlash. Don't be the backlasher. Because we know that women in public life and in leadership do face a kind of scrutiny and sometimes a vitriol that you as men don't. I think any woman here in public life, and there are many, will have experienced at some point a, a very asymmetric degree of judgment and response to what she's doing. So if you see that happening, maybe you can help, you know, especially the men here, maybe you can say, mate, you need to stand down. Yeah? That's, that's not okay. Especially on social media. It's, it's vitriolic. It's a jungle. Uh, people who don't have names or faces, um, they need to stand down because nobody who's doing their best to make a contribution for, to public life should be facing that sort of thing. So don't be the backlash. There's some kind of fear, I don't know what it is. Oh, you have to be a psychologist to know what it is that generates this sort of deep guttural reaction to women in leadership and women, women taking a role in power. Let me tell you, we're not here to take over. We're here to take part. And we know, every study will tell you, that diverse groups make better decisions. And that's good for the men too. The FFA Congress reforms last year embraced the 40-40-20 rule. 40% male, 40% female, 20% any gender. So if we can see that implemented throughout the football community in Australia, we are going to have a stronger football community. So that's the first thing. Don't be a backlasher. The next thing not to be is a snoozer. You know, the one who says, it's not my problem. Yeah, it's not really much I can do about this. It's always been that way. It's, it's just kind of normal, like, and it's not my problem anyway. Well, I'll tell you what else used to be normal. It used to be normal to put kids down coal mines when they were seven or eight years old. It used to be normal to take Africans halfway around the world to work for free and be enslaved on sugar plantations or on cotton farms. That used to be normal. And the ordinary decent people of that era, the besuited, church-going, decent people of the time, thought it was fine. Because that was normal. Until someone said, well, actually, no. That is grotesque. That is not fair. That is morally bankrupt. And then things started to change. And we should all remember that our legacy is not judged by our peers, it's judged by our grandchildren. Right? So in the end, you don't want to be the last guy who had slaves on his cotton farm. You don't want to be remembered for that. You want to be the first guy who did the right thing, not the last guy who did the wrong thing. So that's the second thing. Don't be the snoozer. Don't be the snoozer when it comes to women in sport and gender equality. So let's be more positive, a couple of do's that we can all do. Whenever you're around sport, I would say ask two questions. The first question 
is about representation. Have a look at who's making the decisions. Have a look at the groups in the committee rooms, in the boardrooms, on the selection panels. And if you don't see a gender diverse group, if you don't see a diverse group, then you need to ask some questions. You need to ask why. Because diverse groups make better decisions. They're better thought through from more angles and you get a better outcome. The second question, resourcing. Where does the oxygen go in your organisation or in your sport? What's the gender balance of the budget? What kind of programs do you choose to support? Who's in your coaching courses? Do you have a safeguarding program that's adequate, that's good enough? If you're a sponsor, well, first of all, thank you if you're a sponsor. But maybe you could ask yourself, what is the gender split of my sponsorship dollar? And is that in line with the brand values that I tell my customers I stand for? If you're in government, have a look at government spend. Where do the facilities go? Who's got what share of the green grass around, around Adelaide? And who's using it? Is that a fair split? Is that what you tell your voters that you stand for? If you're in media, what's the balance of your coverage? What's the balance of your expenditure? Who gets prime time? And is that the kind of world that you want your kids to grow up thinking is normal? So these are the questions that you can ask yourself about how we spend our resources. Because gender inequality hurts us all. But let's recognise that in South Australia, we have been absolutely in the forefront, historically, on gender equality. Because, as you probably know, South Australia was the first place in the world where women could both vote and stand for parliament. Which is remarkable. It's a remarkable achievement. And we've produced many quality parliamentarians who are women from this state over the years. Some are in the room. I won't try and name them all because I'll miss some out. But we were the first in the world to do that. Now, you are, the people in this room, you are the clubs, you are the federation, you are the management, you're the sponsors, you're the government, you're the governing bodies. You can decide what kind of game we want. You don't have to be beholden to what was normal in the past. We've been the first in the world at doing things before. One of the most profound changes to our democracy, to democracies globally. We were the first to do it because some people, 125 years ago, had the imagination to envisage a different world and then to make it happen. Well, we can do that in football. Imagine the kind of game we want. Do we want a full high marsh for the W League? Do we want the best, best pathways in Australia for our kids coming through? Do we want a full stadium for a Women's World Cup match here, perhaps, in 2023? With the global giants of football coming to Adelaide to put on a show with a billion people watching? So let me ask you again. Who thinks we can get 48,000 to the W League? Yeah, I'm getting a few more now. We've moved the needle a little bit. Because, you know, you've all spent two hours this week conversing and listening to what we can do for women in football. So I challenge you to spend two hours this week and every week actually doing something, about asking those questions, digging out the answers, and maybe yourself moving the dial within your circle of influence, your club, your organisation, to make a difference. And together, let's change the second half. Thank you.